Perhaps this is the place to state my own views of the relationship between the full Scandinavian mythical sources and the broken English remains. It is clear that orthodox opinion regards the sources of Scandinavian mythology as likely to mislead if they are used to fill gaps in the picture of an old English heaven, earth and hell, peopled by gods, men and giants. Orthodoxy, it seems to me, has swung so far from what may be false just, just, that it is also a way off the truth. Where both Old English and Old Norse parallel sources remain, there is where both Old English and Old Norse parallel sources remain, there is, with some exceptions to be discussed later, a large measure of agreement. I've already indicated one example, that of Wayland Volland, a story where no connected account remains in Old English, but where other English sources show convincingly the complete correspondence of the Old English and Old Norse tales. I should now like to discuss another case of an Anglo-Saxon myth, which Orthodox opinion accepts without argument as being derived from the Old Testament, but which can be demonstrated to be basically pagan and in fact of Northwest European and ultimately Indo-European provenance. I am referring to the myth of the world flood. References to, references to the flood are found in Beowulf at line 111. The poet mentions supernatural creatures who he says were sprung from Cain, monsters, ettins and elves and orcs, also giants who battled against God for a long time. In the end, he paid them for it. The way in which God paid for the giants is later described when the Beowulf poet speaks of an ancient sword hilt which had the story cut on it in runes. Can't stop thinking about Lord of the Rings. It had been written long ago, a tale of a struggle of former days in which a flood, a boiling ocean, engulfed the race of giants. They had lived in pride, a people estranged from the eternal Lord. And for that, the ruler gave them their final requital in the whelming waters. In his history of the Anglo-Saxons, Hodgkin dismisses the story out of hand when he remarks that the old English giants were not of the substance to fight the gods. The references just quoted from Beowulf give Hodgkin the lie. On the other hand, Mrs Dorothy Whitelock, in an audience of Beowulf, Beowulf page 5, assumes without argument that the flood referred to in Beowulf's is the biblical flood. On the face of it, we might be tempted to agree. After all, having experienced 2000 years of Christianity, it comes to a shock to us to be told that there are over 500 myths of a world flood ranging from the Sumerian to Amerindian. Amerindian. Again, the beings in Beowulf who drown in the flood are said to descend from Cain and they are punished by the Lord. But when we inquire into these apparently biblical characters, we find that they have nothing whatsoever, whatsoever to do with the Old Testament. And in fact, they are the Ettins and Elves and Orcs, also giants, who have been lifted straight from the Anglo-Saxon pagan mythology. We then begin to suspect that the Beowulf poet was Christianizing pagan material. And so he was. Such monsters as he names were part and parcel of the heathen mythology and had nothing to do with Cain until old English converts tried to combine element, elements from their own pagan myth with the new Christian one. Etins, elves and orcs are all words of native origin. Giant is not. It comes through the Latin from Greek. Because the Beowulf poet uses the word giant, which possibly came into English via the Vulgate Bible, Mrs. Whitelock assumes that he was lifting to the biblical story of the flood. Miss Whitelock goes on to say that the poet's audience must have understood the connection of the world giant with the Vulgate because the poet offers no gloss for it. This argument is like Hodgkin's about the old English giants not being of the stuff to fight against the gods. The text Beowulf gives it the lie. For it is not until the poet has exhausted all the native words, ettins and elves and orcs, that he adds a final synonym, giants. The Bible story of the flood 
tells how the men of the ancient world, not giants, were all drowned except one man, Noah, and his descendants. The essential part of the myth is that Noah, who saved in his ark, is that Noah was saved in his ark. The Beowulf myth tells of giants who fought against God and most significantly there is no mention of an ark. It is unthinkable that a Christian poet writing of the biblical flood should have missed out the ark. Now, the heathen Scandinavian version of the Deluge says that three gods, Odin, Vili and Ve, fell out with the race of giants and killed their leader, Ymir, whose blood poured forth to the, form the ocean in which all the other giants except Bergelmir and his wife were drowned. These two lived on to perpetrate the giant race, but the three gods created the earth out of Ymir's carcass, having created the sea from his blood. This, I contend, is much more likely to have been the version cut in runes on the sword described in Beowulf, and I have no doubt whatsoever that the poet was referencing to an, referring to an actual sword hilt of ancient pagan workmanship which he himself had seen. Such an heirloom of our race stands in the same relationship to the flood myth as the Frank's casket does to the Wayland story, and who knows but what some day the spade may not turn it up. It is admitted that later accounts of the Norse deluge myth after the 16th century say that the giant Burgomir escaped the flood by going up into his boat, but a glance at the earliest manuscript dating to the 13th century shows that Burgomir is said originally to have escaped by climbing up onto his mill or mill stand. This was not understood by later editors who substituted the word batter, boat, for Luda, mill or mill stand, no doubt on the analogy of the Old Testament story. As I have said, there are over 500 world flood myths deriving from both eastern and western hemispheres. The Hebrew tale itself is a derivative of an earlier one, namely the ancient Mesopotamian story of Ut Nafistim, Nafistim, the Sumerian Noah. Its main situation is the saving of mankind. On the other hand, the Old English version, as we have it in Beowulf, is the same as the Norse one and ultimately related to the Northwest European story. It's not about salvation myth at all, that at least is obvious, but it's the creation myth, given one version of how the land, sea and air came into existence. As such, it goes back to Indo-European times and takes its place as another of the hundreds of flood myths still extant. Oh my god, this one goes on forever. I'm only moaning because I'm aching. Probably going to be three parts this one. Such argument as the above is perhaps a little tedious, but it is necessary to scotch attempts at Christianising pagan myths by modern writers, as well as to reinforce my claim that more often than not, the Old English and Old Norse versions of myth are in agreement, and that Norse sources are, in general, reliable guides to supplement our own. But I myself shall argue that our old English remains, both literary and other, hold far more evidence of the ancient heathenism than has yet been brought to light. It will be my purpose to show forth this evidence in the following pages, but before doing so, I would like to discuss some literary attestations of the heathen beliefs of our ancestors, which are generally accepted by modern writers. Uh, shall I pause? because I don't feel well, I'll keep going. The Anglo-Saxon charms bear witness to native pagan beliefs. These incantations are often difficult to interpret, being a mixture of Old English, Latin, Greek, Celtic, Hebrew and Norse, elements sometimes reduced to plain gibberish, with a superficial Christ Christianization to add to the confusion. The chief sources are the two British museums called Leechbrook and Lakanga written between AD 950 and 1050. How truly ancient are the charms may be gathered from a modern example for curing a sprain recorded in many parts of England, Scotland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Estonia, Finland and Hungary. Our Lord raid his foal's foot slayed, down he lighted, his foal's foot righted, bone to bone, sinew to sinew, Blood to blood, flesh to flesh, heal in the same of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. This charm for a sprain is found a thousand years earlier 
in 9th century Germany with the original pagan personages who were later to be superseded by our Lord. Foll, i.e. Balder, and Woden rode to the wood where Balder's foal wrenched its foot. Then Woman ch Woden charmed, as he well knew how, as for bone wrench, so for blood wrench, so for limb wrench, bone to bone, blood to blood, limbs to limb, as if they were glued. The second Merschberg charm, as it is called, can be paralleled by a similar one from the Hindu Atvara Veda of about 500 BC, showing that our Lord Raid is part of a body of material of Indo-European origin. In fact, the charms reflect religious ideas which appear to be older than the worship of personalised gods. I mean worship by our ancestors of sun, moon and earth. The charm for increasing the fertility of the fields, sometimes called Aesobot, contains a pagan hymn to the sun and another to the earth. The hymn to the sun is introduced by the exhortation. Turn to the east and bowing humbly nine times, say then these words. Eastwards I stand for favours I pray, I pray the great Lord, I pray the mighty Prince, I pray the holy warden of the heavenly kingdom, to earth I pray and, to, and up to heaven. Then turn three times sunwise and stretch yourself along the ground full length and say the litany here. Here is the obvious sun worship, no matter how obscured by Christian influence, just as the following embodies earth worship. Ekra, 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 Mother of Earth, hail to thee, Earth, Mother of Men, be fruitful in God's embrace, filled with food for the use of men. Then take every kind of meal you have, a loaf baked no bigger than the palm of your hand, have kneaded it with milk and holy water, and lay it under the first turned furrow. This kind of hymn, together with instruction in the ritual and sacrifice, gives some insight into the ministrations of pagan priests. Moon worship is reflected in two charms from the herb Herbarium 8 and 10, where instructions are given to boil herbs in water when the moon is waning and to wash the patient with the liquor, or to wreathe clove wart with red thread round a lunatic's neck when the moon is waning in April or early in October. Soon he will be healed. There is little other literary attestation of moon worship but there is no doubt of there is no doubt of its existence the laws of canute expressly forbid moon worship which not much effect with not much effect if observances which have lasted to the present day offer any clue i am thinking of various ritual acts practiced by some country gardeners who will not plant seeds except that particular phase of the moon and nearer home I have vivid memories of my old grandmother's, well, it's the thingy almanac, in it? The farmer's almanac or something. I have vivid memories of my old grandmother who, to all intents and purposes, a countrywoman of devoutly religious orthodoxy, every month without fail consulted the calendar for the rising of the new moon so that she could potter out into the garden, pinier in hand, to avoid a first sight of the bright deity through a window. To see the new moon first through glass, even spectacles, was sure to bring bad luck. In other words, such a misfortune was offensive to the deity who could be expected to react adversely. We know from old Saxon and old Norse sources that the sun and moon came to be regarded respectively as a goddess and a god, not the other way about as in classical, classical myth. And additional proof that our forebears held such beliefs we can find in the names of the first two days of the week, Sunday and Monday. But as I have already said, there are elements in sun and moon worship which have even deeper roots than the regard for personalised gods. Such elements find expression in the various Bronze Age symbols representing the sun, like the four-spoked wheel or cross, and moon found carved on the rocks in Scandinavia, as well as in sun chariots such as the one found in Trondholm in Denmark. Whether or not to what extent such sun and moon worship was passed on to our northwest European ancestors from the Aborigines of the north, whom they overran and absorbed, it is perhaps impossible now to determine. Well, I'm having a break. Bear with. 